Thanks for tuning in to Movie Geeks United. Robert Altman was the maverick of American filmmaking, and it's a singular identity he maintained throughout his five-decade career. He started in TV, but hit his stride with 1970s MASH and continued to challenge, mystify, and delight audiences until his final film, A Prairie Home Companion, in 2006. In this episode, we're pleased to examine the diverse works of Altman with David Sterrett, the celebrated critic, scholar, and author of a number of books on figures like John Luc Godard, Terry Gilliam, Clint Eastwood, and Alfred Hitchcock. He is also the editor of the book Robert Altman Interviews. Please note that this conversation was conducted in 2019 for our series Movie Geek Yearbook. Visit moviegeekyearbook.com for more information. There were these tremendous innovations that were happening, especially in European film, and so many of us were absolutely fascinated with the French New Wave and with the Italian films of Fellini and Antonioni and Visconti and so forth, and various developments like that. And then those started to have a pretty powerful interest on American film, but I should say influence on American film as well. So uh, by the time we get into the 70s, uh, we're definitely looking at still a very vigorous, a uh, lot of European imports and imports from, from other parts of the world as well coming into America and strongly influencing American film. So basically film language was being reinvented in, uh, in, 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 in quite a number of ways. And once you start to get into the so-called new Hollywood, which doesn't really start until we're, for me at least, until we're into the 1970s, uh, you have uh, filmmakers who are really, they're, they're much more, uh, the, the most important filmmakers are much more interested than ever before in making personal cinema in making cinema that is not just dictated by corporate interests uh, and in incorporating and inflecting uh, some of the innovations that were brought by those tremendous personal filmmakers from Europe. So all of those things put together, the influence in personal filmmaking, the European influences uh, really uh, generated a whole, really, a, I'm not sure there really is such thing as a new Hollywood, but there's definitely a new, a, new, a new spirit in American movies as we get into the 1970s. And out of this came Robert Altman, who really broke through that year with MASH. And he had been working steadily uh, years and years prior, but it seems like I think he was something like 45, 46, but he, and before he broke out, but it seemed like the perfect timing for, for Robert Altman to emerge. Yeah, no, absolutely. He was in his 40s uh, when he came along. But as you point out, uh, he had been working steadily, but he had not been working steadily in feature films. He had done a cheesy little bit of major TV series, but I would have pegged him at the time as somebody who was going to spend his whole life directing uh, directing TV series for, 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 for shows like Combat and, and Bonanza and, and uh, Peter Gunn and Whirly Birds and stuff like that. Uh, but he kind of made a partial breakthrough. Again, after some very minor feature film work, uh, he made a partial breakthrough in 1969 with That Cold Day in the Park, a melodrama, but a very interesting and kind of offbeat melodrama. You can see some aspects of the Altman style start to be developed in that movie. But the real breakthrough came along in the very early years of what's now sometimes called the New Hollywood when he made MASH. And it's funny, when I look back on MASH in later years, I think, my gosh, there's an awful lot of time spent on that comical foot ball game. Uh, in some ways, this movie really is just kind of an audience pleaser, you know, a crowd pleaser. It really goes out of its way to entertain, uh, and it accomplishes that, and it was, a, it was a very successful movie. Everybody was talking about it when it came out. But some of the things that Altman did stylistically in that movie were pretty much unheard of for him and for anybody. I'm thinking of things like the overlapping dialogue. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about things like the, like, you know, that phenomenal Altman sound mix with all those different voice tracks mingled together and mixed so carefully so that we hear what we have to hear. But a lot of the times we're hearing a lot of voices at the same time, but the PA announcements and so forth, but that at the end of the film are giving the, the credits, uh, things like this, uh, which were just such breakthrough things. And, you know, the important thing is not that Altman did this, uh, the same way that it's not so important that Hitchcock made Psycho or that Kubrick made Dr. Strangelove. It's that these movies 
instantly caught up with audiences. That's what's really important. This was the sign that new things were really brewing and that we weren't just dealing with an eccentric artist doing an eccentric thing. Nash, in a lot of ways, is a real crowd pleaser, but in some ways it's really eccentric, and the eccentricities did not cancel out the, the crowd pleasing. People loved the movie, and that launched Altman, and it really launched a whole new, or helped to launch, a whole new way of thinking about movies, that movies could be offbeat, even strange, and still really attract audiences if they were made if they were made correctly and if they kind of are tuned into exactly the right wavelength. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, as we, we we pointed out, he 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 really uh, did a lot of work prior to Mash, but once Mash hits, he it seems like he has a fully formed sense of himself as a filmmaker and his particular unique qualities and sensibilities and but do you think that he felt that audiences were ready for for his approach to movies when it when it started with match well i'm sure he hoped that they were (laughs) you know uh exactly what was in his mind is another story he's given a lot of interviews over the years i i edited a book of them uh and he said different things at different times i he has often said though and maybe this is the best way to so to summarize an answer to your question, uh, he, has, he, he said in the later 1970s that he often felt like little Liza on the, on the ice floes in Uncle Tom's cabin with the hound dogs yapping on her uh, and she, her just barely, barely escaping uh, from, from the mob at every moment, uh, moment to moment. And I, I, I think that's always been his attitude, that uh, once he got to start making movies the way he wanted to, and it was really the success of Nash that opened that up for him, uh, he then almost he, he, right from then on he, he was taking chance he was taking more chances he didn't then settle there were certain aspects of Nash that did turn out to be his style that that just lasted for decades uh, but he didn't just make other movies like Nash he made movies that innovated in all kinds of other ways and often he was just ahead of the of the mob uh, that mm. was after him and really a lot of the times his movies failed. A lot of times they failed commercially. Uh, I'm talking about even during maybe his greatest decade, which was the 1970s. And a lot of times they failed with critics, even the critics who were sympathetic to his very experimental ideas. So uh, he was all, you know, every single time he made a movie, he thought, I'm sure he thought, and he has said this, this is going to be a great picture. This is going to be my best picture yet. Everybody's going to love this picture. And really often that did not turn out to be the case. And always he was able to pick up his marbles and move on to the next game immediately and keep right on taking chances. That's what I admire about him more than anything. Yeah, and I, I love his uh, creative process. It felt very uh, organic uh, where, where he where the discoveries were, were being made uh, on, the, on the fly as, the, as they were occurring. Um, and it was all captured on camera. I mean, the script was really a, a blueprint for him. Um, and it was such a unique way of working. Even I understand his actors weren't even sure of what the hell he was doing. <laughs> Sometimes that was true. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I'll mention the French filmmaker Jacques Rivet, who was sort of very similar in this regard. Uh, even though neither one of them was... Rivette was certainly not a commercial filmmaker by any stretch of the imagination. Altman was a commercial filmmaker who often made uncommercial films, but both of them could get almost anybody to work with them gladly for minimal fees because they gave the actors, and I use that in the gender neutral sense, that they gave the actors a really lot of genuine creative input. So we have the opposite here of the Ingmar Bergman, who is always telling the actors exactly what to do and don't deviate from the script, and I want you to move your head just as much at this moment. Uh, Altman was one of the few filmmakers who really wanted the creative input. Well, of everybody, really, he was famous for that. He would take suggestions all over the place, uh, but especially maybe from his performers, which is how he managed to get always so many terrific ones. It's something I asked him about, I think, more than once over the years. When I would ask him about the auteur theory. And he would say, well, you know, what I really am is a filter. 
all these ideas are coming to me from these different people, the writers, the actors, the cinematographers, the designers, everybody. They're all giving these, uh, these, this input, and I'm choosing, and I'm saying, that's a good idea, that's not a good idea. I'm the filter. And of course, what needs to be in. Pat Altman had billions of ideas of his own, so he wasn't only filtering ideas from other people, but he was always welcoming input from other people, which he would then sort through in his own, I think, very intuitive way. Yeah, and uh, with, with MASH, uh, one more question about MASH. Um, yeah. It takes place during the Korean War, yep. uh, and we're in the midst of the, the Vietnam conflict, obviously. Uh, uh, it's Obviously, he's wanting to draw parallels, and I'm wondering, what are those parallels? Yeah, well, I mean... On, 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 on a really sort of a crude level, you can say, you know, a war is a war. Uh, and so uh, you don't have to be making a movie about the, 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 the war of the moment to be making a comment on the war of the moment. And of course, the war of that moment was Vietnam. Uh, one reason why MASH is about the Korean War may be that it's based on a book, which is about the Korean War. But the Korean War was not that far in the past, you know, from the early, earlier part of the 1950s, basically. Uh, so it's not that far in the past. And the Vietnam War was still totally, you know, it, 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 we were in the middle of everything. Uh, nobody knew how it was going to come out. Nobody knew where things were going to go. The anti-war movement was extremely vigorous in 1970, but nobody knew whether it would prevail. So uh, in a way, making a movie about the Korean War was you know, a war that was over and which had its own horrors, as all wars do, was, I think, a way of you know, making a movie about something that, had, that was in a way settled, historically speaking, while using that as a way of comment on what was going on right now, which was not settled, historically speaking. I, I think it was a perfectly defensible decision, if not perhaps an ideal decision. Mm. And my favorite uh, Altman movie, or the, the one that's dearest to my heart, has always been McCabe and Mrs. Miller. The, mm. it, it, it feels like no other movie to me. There's such a beautiful melancholy in that film. Um, and there's a couple of points I want to discuss with you about it. Looking at McCabe and Mrs. Miller and, and comparing it to his other work, how does he approach the male-female? Uh, what is his approach to d determining the contrast between the feminine and the masculine? Yeah, well, another thing about Altman is that uh, he was always paid a lot of attention to his female characters. You know, Hollywood has always been and continues to be, as we all know, so incredibly male-dominated and male-oriented uh, and straight white, and straight white male uh, to boot. Uh, Altman really has always paid a whole lot of attention to his female characters as well. So maybe that's just one first thing to just uh, just say for the record. Uh, the relationship between those two title characters is really fascinating in McCabe and Mrs. Miller. And I have to say uh, that uh, you know, it is the movie, whatever else it is, it is not a love story. It is very much a part of the kind of anti-Western trend uh, that was going on at that time and to which Altman made what is arguably the greatest of all contributions with, uh, with McCabe and Mrs. Miller. But I don't think he was so much interested in exploring uh, man and woman as such as he was in exploring a particular kind of, of unsettled society where things were completely up for grabs, where everything was in a constant state of flux. Nobody knew exactly what today would bring, much less what tomorrow would bring. And in this setting, in this environment, these two extremely different kinds of characters happen to be thrown together. And what develops between them is partly their own relationship, but partly their representation maybe of larger, uh, larger uh, uh, kind of trajectories of the masculine and the feminine at that very unsettled time. Uh, you know, in, 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 in early American society. That's really as specific as I can be, I think, about that, unless you want me to point me in, in maybe a more, a more uh, specific direction. No, I think that's absolutely right. It, and and uh, another thing I love about the film is the fact that you're talking about an unsettled society, the, the, and the society is being built as the movie is being filmed. So you, you feel the town itself kind of expanding as the movie goes along. It's beautiful. Absolutely. And, and, and Altman was having the, 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 the sets built. 
you know, while the movie was going, the town was literally growing uh, as, as they were they were shooting the movie. Uh, you know, one more thing about you know, you asked about the you know the the, the man and the woman and McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Yeah, they're both capitalists. Uh, you know, McCabe shows up because he's going to set up a tavern and he's going to set up a body house. And it turns out that that's exactly what Mrs. Miller wants to do, too. Uh, and so I think that's also a very, very big part of this. The, the, the America itself, and certainly the West in particular, was being built on uh, the spoils of exploitation of all different kinds. And these two are exploiters. They're capitalists in that sense. Uh, they're going to make uh, money off the, the lower instincts uh, of the local populace. So they're, they're not only people who get involved with each other. Well, they get involved with each other in multiple ways. But one of them is their competitors. Uh, they're competitors, and in a weird sort of a way, they're friends. And I think that their their uh, their their uh, complete involvement in the idea of 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 of, of uh, supporting themselves from the spoils of exploitation, it, it's a part of both their personalities, and that's what both brings them together, and which what ultimately separates them as well. Yeah, and it was such a. Such a strange uh, collaboration when you consider it between Beatty and, and Altman, because Altman is obviously has kind of a f- more freewheeling style, and, and Warren Beatty is the controller. Uh, and I always think about, you know, it, the flip side of that would be something like uh, Clint Eastwood acting in a Stanley Kubrick movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. No, that's very, very interesting. And of course, Beatty being an aspiring filmmaker himself and, you know, who eventually became one of some importance. So you're absolutely right. But, you know, something else I think is worth mentioning in here is that between Nash and McCabe and Mrs. Miller, uh, we have Brewster McLeod. Mm. Uh, which was a real failure, and which Altman, for years afterward, when he was asked what was his favorite among his own pictures, he would say, Brewster McLeod, because I think you always love your ugly child it's the most, it's the u- u- ugliest child the most, meaning the one that really didn't make it with the public or with the critics. Uh, for years, I also admired Brewster McLeod very, very much, and then eventually I, I, I sort of got tired of it, and I realized that it was a tiring sort of a movie in some ways. But what, what I, the reason I bring up Brewster to McLeod is it comes in between Nash and McCabe and Mrs. Miller. So when Altman sets to work on making this very unconventional Western uh, starring Julie Christie from England and Warren Beatty from Hollywood, uh, he has, is coming fresh off a gigantic failure. So, I shouldn't say gigantic because Bruce in the Cloud wasn't a big production, but a movie that really didn't make it in its own time and which was hugely experimental. So Bruce, Bruce in the Cloud is in its own way, I think, equally experimental. And yet Altman is now working again with really major people and they are putting their trust in him. Warren Beatty, as you point out, perhaps an unlikely collaborator, but he's putting all of his trust in Altman, as is Julie Christie, as are all the members of that phenomenal supporting cast. And you know, this is to, to all of their credit. It's, it is interesting because you point out Brewster McLeod and its failure. He did make a series of very odd little eccentric films that uh, many times alienated audiences. Uh, and uh, I remember, there, I don't remember if it was Three Women or Images, but I remember him saying that he had a dream the night before and then he went to the studio the next day and pitched it and they bought it. And it was one of those two films. I forget which yeah, one. That was Three Women. And, uh, you know, again, over the years, he has told differing stories about <laughs> that. Uh, okay. And exactly how, you know, no, you know the, 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 the constant thing, <laughs> the crux of it seems to be. And again, I'm not sure I would take this as being literally true, even just this sort of nub of it, which I'm about to mention. But I think that it's likely that something like this did happen, that he had a dream when he woke up, he jotted down a whole lot of elements of the dream. And he said that some of the times he said that the dream was actually a dream about making this movie uh, rather than a dream of the story of the movie itself. But, you know, maybe that's just uh, a nuance. But mm. the point is he had a dream. He sort of jotted down the dream. And then he went in and he pitched it as a dreamlike movie based on a dream. And he managed to sell that. And then that's when the screenplay came into being. So, yeah, 
Uh, that was a movie that's very much uh, based on a dream and very much about a dream, and he uh, took his own screenplay credit, screenplay credit on that. Now, Images, uh, the other movie you were thinking of, which comes from a few years earlier, uh, the early 70s, was a movie about a, a schizophrenic woman, which very much is from her point of view. It is the world as seen, the falling apart world as seen by this psychotic woman. Uh, and so, you know, Three Women is... I will say a less a less fragmented film, uh, a less sort of over the top zany. Well, I don't want to use the word zany. A less over the top crazy film than Images, but to my mind, it's one of the greatest films he ever made because with a very fluid, continuous narrative style, he conveys this very, very, very dreamlike sense of instability, of fluidity, of reality always not falling apart the way it does in images, but always kind of shifting and flowing and changing its shape as you're experiencing it. So Three Women, I think this movie, based on a dream, and again, that part of the story I think is true, uh, is one of, I think one of the most uh, 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 successfully dreamlike movies ever made by anybody anywhere, and it also works as a story. Uh, mm. It's a terrific film. It has a very, very mysterious ending. It certainly does not wrap things up into a neat package, but then again, Altman rarely did that anyway. Uh, but it's a movie that, that manages to get you involved in a story, and with three fascinating characters, those three women, women of the title, uh, while at the same time having this constantly morphing, constantly fluxing and shifting sense of, of like you're experiencing a dream while you watch this movie. For, for me, it's, it's one of Alton's very, very greatest films. And much like, uh, I also want to ask about The Long Goodbye, because uh, I have another movie I adore, much like his Re- recalibration of the Western and McCabe, I think he's doing the same thing with a very established genre in, in The Long Goodbye. Um, it, and it goes back to the, the question of masculinity as, as well, because when you think of someone like Humphrey Bogart, you have this, this strong, tough detective, and, and you have a certain image of what that character should be of Marlowe. And then you cast Elliot Gould, and just by the nature of casting Gould, <laughs> it kind of turns a lot of that out of its head. Yeah, well, that is for sure. And I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, it, it's very easy to slot McCabe and Mrs. Miller into the, 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 the anti-Western genre. The long goodbye has to come into maybe the, I'm not sure what you'd call it, the anti-noir genre, not in the sense that it's against noir or the fact that it rejects noir, but like the anti-Western, uh, it, it's still a Western. The long goodbye is still a private eye movie. It's just a very, very different kind of a one. And what, you know, Altman always said a couple of things about the long goodbye. One, that, uh, his basic idea was to take this uh, Raymond Chandler character, uh, who has hated it back in the way he was, I guess you could say, in the black and white age of film war, and transport him into the present day uh, and make a movie about him. Uh, and that, that's one way of radically revising that genre. But the other thing, and this is what always fascinates me most about The Long Goodbye, is that, as Altman said, it's a movie where the private eye is always looking in the wrong place. And so he goes through this whole movie, and he does end up solving the crime. Yes, the solution turns out to be exactly the opposite of what he or anybody thought it would be, uh, and he sort of solves it almost by accident. So, uh, yeah, it's a movie that turns the private eye genre upside down, just as he turns the Western genre upside down in The Cave and Mrs. Miller, the war movie genre partly upside down in MASH, uh, the, the musical upside down in Nashville. Uh, oh, the guy just loved to take genres apart, sh- sort of shake them up in a big box, and then put the pieces back in a new way. And it's so potent in The Long Goodbye because uh, he takes all of those established tropes, uh, the bravado. I mean, it opens with a big sequence of him trying to get his cat some food from the grocery <laughs> That's store. Right. And there's a, there's a scene where... He, Henry Gibson, of all people, smacks Sterling Hayden across the face. Uh, I mean, there's there's all of these shocking, surprising moments in that movie. I just I just love it. But the other thing that I love is his feeling for environment. He was able to conjure up the spirit of of an environment or a world, unlike any other director of the time. I think. And then the prime example of that for me is, of course, Nashville. 
And yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about his his capturing of that moment in time and that place. Yeah. Well, uh, to pick up just for a moment uh, about the the, about the the broad idea of the, the sense of environment. I mean, here we have one aspect of, of Altman's uh, primary creative contribution to the language of cinema, if I can put it in highfalutin terms like that, which is his use of the moving camera and the zoom lens. Uh, the zoom lens regarded by so many as a kind of a gimmicky thing, and it's too lazy. You're too lazy to track the camera. You just zoom the lens and stuff like that, which he turned into primary tools of a profoundly personal way of making movies. And this stylistic combination of the moving camera and the zoom lens, which he puts to brilliant use in so many uh, movies, is at once a, uh, a really essential part of his unique visual style his unique creative style as a, as a, well, he had an audio visual style because the layered soundtracks were equally important. So I'll add that in <laughs> the moving camera, the zoom lens and the, and the multi-layered soundtrack, especially, especially, audio especially profound with the long goodbye. I mean, I don't think there was a single shot in that movie that wasn't in motion. And that's maybe a particularly vivid example of it, but it just runs throughout all of his important films and pretty much all of his films. And again, this becomes both an aspect of his own unique style, which is crucially important. It's one of the things that makes him such a, a personal filmmaker. But, you know, a jillion people have picked up a movie camera or, you know, mustered a movie crew. But you look at an Altman movie for about three minutes without knowing what it is, and you know it's an Altman movie. But it also contributes, those also contribute, those factors, to the incredibly vivid sense of environment that comes through in movies like uh, like Nashville, like uh, even Three Women, I would mention, and certainly like The Long Goodbye. So, so th- th- those aspects of his style, which are both personal to him and it's the way he apparently saw the world, uh, they also are part of that incredibly vivid sense of environment that comes through in, you know, in, in I would say, certainly all of his, of his major films. As for Nashville, this is a movie, I don't even want to say it turns the musical genre upside down because it's so unconventional in so many trillions of ways. But Nashville, he famously assembles his 24 characters. And that was more of a publicity gimmick than anything else because there are not 24 significant characters, but there's a whole lot of significant characters. Uh, And uh, he has this place, which is Nashville, and he has this industry, which Nashville is built upon, which is the country music industry. And he takes these ingredients and he puts together what turns out to be, it would almost seem to be, if you didn't know better, a whole movie that was improvised on the spot. Of course, it wasn't. Mm. It was very carefully put together. He thought through all kinds of aspects of it before they ever went near the camera. And then a whole lot was done while the camera was rolling and a whole lot was done in the editing at the end. So, you know, as always, through all the aspects of production, uh, there was a lot of very intense creative labor being put into this. Uh, But what you have is a movie that seems to flow without being dreamlike in the sense that three women is, it seems to flow with the logic of something that is just coming up almost full blown out of both the conscious and the unconscious. Uh, one of the great innovations in that movie, and this is something Altman was really proud of, and I think he overstated the, uh, the total novelty of this a bit, but he was basically right, was that in traditional Hollywood filmmaking, it was always a given that as soon as anybody sings, even if it's somebody singing happy birthday at a birthday party, you immediately felt in the old studio days, you had to go into the recording studio and record it special and then Mm. dub it onto the image. You couldn't just have the person singing while the camera was rolling. That would never do. Had to sound like real singing or whatever the music playing was. And of course, what Altman did was, first of all, to invite the members of his cast to create their own songs and perform their own songs, which they did with incredible results. Who would have dreamed all of those different people who do that in this film would have a talent for that. And then he simply had them record it right there when they were recording the rest of the dialogue and the rest of the ambient sound and so forth. So there's an immediacy to it that you never, ever, ever got in almost any of the musically based films made before that. So Nashville was a real breakthrough in that regard, and that, of course, is part and parcel of what the movie's about, which is about the Nashville industry and about all those individual characters as well. Looking at Nashville, what do you think, if someone were to watch it for the first time, what do you think it would express to them about the America of that time? Well, uh, I hope that 
as with all movies that 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 person encountering it for the first time now would not take it as being literal history. Ah, oh, this is exactly what it was like, and now I understand the country music <laughs> business or anything like that. I mean, movies are always a bad place to go to for history. But what I hope would be captured, well, I hope simultaneously would be captured, would be a sense of one major American medium, I'll call it an American medium, American cinema, of course, you know, that's not to discount all the internationalism of the cinema, but one medium commenting on another major American medium, which is the, the, the country music, the country music medium. Uh, so, you know, here we have the movies commenting on music. We have popular movies because Nashville was certainly made as a popular audience picture commenting on popular music, the kind of music that aims for a real workaday audience of regular folks who just want to hear a good tune and tap their toes. So uh, I hope that they would get a sense of that first. First of all, again, one major American medium commenting on another major American medium, and more important than that, one medium with a good sense of its own limitations and shortcomings and foibles, namely movies, commenting on another medium <laughs> with its own shortcomings and limitations and foibles, namely the music industry. Both you know, Altman knew as well as anybody that as all of these popular, commercially oriented, audience oriented media. Are, 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 are captives of commercialism. And even though Altman had more daring to buck that captivity than maybe any other major filmmaker maybe ever, and for proof, you can look at the long list of totally unsuccessful films that he made, uh, he was aware that he, like everybody else, had to aim at audiences. And here he was capturing, in, in a way, commenting on a medium that was doing it just as successfully as he was, namely the Nashville industry. And I, I, I think that he, he shows w one more thing that an audience might get from the movie today, how uh, a place, namely in this case Nashville, and a business namely in this case, the country music industry, can be completely intertwined with each other, how you can't separate out those two strands. They're each is part and parcel of the other. And I mm. think he captures that just brilliantly in Nashville. The, uh, I wanted to ask you one question about uh, post-70s, because um, with, with the, he must have found it difficult to, to find his place when, when the 80s rolled around. That, that seemed like it might have been a difficult period for him. Well, they were <laughs> extremely difficult for him, as he was very much aware at the time. Again, uh, you know, the 1970s brought Nash and McCabe and Mrs. Miller and the, old, uh, the, the Long Goodbye and Nashville and Three Women, movies which in one way or another were, were great commercial successes, great critical successes, or perhaps both. But there were also all these movies uh, like Brewster McLeod and Images and Thieves Like Us, which is a very good movie, but, you know, not a huge movie. California Split, I would say the same for Buffalo Bill and the Indians or Sitting Bull's History Lesson, a movie that was very badly received, certainly critically in its time. Uh, and then when you get to the, the end of the 80s, excuse me, the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, you have Quintet. Uh, a movie which even he didn't want to talk about years later. Uh, very, very bad memories for that. Uh, I did an interview uh, on stage with him and Garrison Keillor uh, near the end of his life, and I mentioned Quintet, and he just said, oh, let's not talk about that. Uh, and The Perfect Couple, which nobody wanted to see, and nobody was interested in, and Health, Ditto. And then Popeye. Oh, with Robin Williams, who I personally couldn't tolerate. But Popeye actually didn't do badly at the box office, but it mm. was perceived as a massive failure, and it pretty much ended his Hollywood career. So the 80s became, for Altman, largely a lost decade. In an interview I did with him near the beginning of the 80s, he said, I'm just not even going to try this anymore. This, this, this Hollywood or even independent movie making overlapping with the industry, it's just impossible. I'm going to see about this new medium of video where there seems to be a lot of, a lot of openings for new things to be done. And sure enough, he spent most of the 80s doing TV movies like like, like uh, The Laundromat, a uh, title which has been recycled now uh, by Steven Zoderberg, mm. of basements, things like this, uh, you know, these things. And doing stuff on the stage. Uh, I saw Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean on Broadway. And then he made a movie adaptation of that, which is really pretty good. Uh, other 
movies based on stage plays like Screamers, which I thought at the time was so bad it was almost unwatchable. Secret Honor, a very interesting movie uh, about, uh, about Richard M. Nixon. Uh, but again, he spent most of the 80s working outside the feature film field, or at least working in, in a sort of a, of a sideways way, uh, doing, doing TV movies, uh, basically videos, uh, and doing uh, doing stage plays, he did a number of plays on the stage at that time, and then making movie adaptations of some of those. And also, you know, there was his big mini series near the end of the eighties, uh, Tanner or eighty eight, which was pretty successful. So yeah. the eighties, in a way, were kind of a lost decade for for, for Altman. And, you know, to move a little bit beyond that, when he made Vincent and Theo, uh, his movie about uh, Vincent van Gogh and his brother, uh, oh, he expected that to be his big comeback film. Uh, he really did. I remember I was on the New York Film Festival Selection Committee at that time, and they were so surprised when we did not select it for the festival because they were sure it was a shoe in That was going to be the big comeback film. In fact, he was off by just a little bit because the big comeback film turned to be the player at the beginning of the 90s. But you're absolutely right. Major achievements came up during the 80s. I would mention particularly Tanner 88. But for the most part, that was uh, in terms of, of making sort of regular feature films. That was kind of a lost decade for the great Robert Altman. Yeah, but at least, I mean, I'm comforted to know that he did enjoy a renaissance uh, toward, towards the end of his opening, starting with, as you said, the player. And it it it, it, last, it lasted, I I think, until his death. But um, I think the A Prairie Home Companion is almost an ideal swan song in his career. I mean, it it feels like that to me. Well, I think uh, he certainly saw it that way. He certainly saw it as a swan song. And I mean, if I can just bridge the gap a little bit between, you know, a movie like The Player and then A Prairie Home Companion and, and this kind of resurgence that he had. Absolutely. The Player is a phenomenal movie. It holds up really well. I've seen it any number of times, including recently. And it's a really amazing movie. Then he made Shortcuts, which has got to be in some ways the most ambitious movie he ever made. It's probably the longest mm. uh, as a, just as a feature film. Uh, with a jillion characters in it. Uh, and, and when I first saw it, I found it rather disjointed, and I thought that the sort of earthquake uh, climax was sort of uh, arbitrary. But, you know, it's, it, it's a movie that holds up well to repeat viewing, but then he makes a movie like Ready to Wear, Preta Porte, which was a <laughs> massive failure, you know? So we still have Altman taking chances. We still have him succeeding sometimes, failing other times, but usually doing it on his own terms. Kansas City was a very interesting movie, which got him back into the music scene again, got him back into his own roots of Kansas City, but it wasn't really received as a major film. And even though, you know, the way in which he succeeded going into the later part of the 90s is that he kept on being able to make real feature films with pretty major casts. Uh, he makes The Gingerbread Man, probably one of the most conventional films of his career, and I think almost designed, whether consciously or not, to show he could make a regular story film like anybody else. Uh, but, then, but then he makes something like The Company, which is, yeah. uh, which is uh, I watched The Company, I, I, and I loved it, because I thought, I think he's finally done it, where he's found a way around the traditional three-act structure. Well, I think he did that way earlier, actually. I mean, there have always been his large canvas films and his small canvas films. Going back to the earlier years, uh, Three Women is definitely a small canvas film with its three main characters and its limited number of locations. Uh, Nashville is a great example of the large canvas films with many, many characters. Uh, one of my favorite Altman films, which I just have to mention, is A Wedding which I think mm. is a phenomenal movie with a genuinely mystical edge to it. And it takes place in one place on one occasion, a wedding. Uh, and yet it deals with a claim to double the characters of, of, of Nashville, 48 characters, again, nowhere near that number of significant characters, but is tremendously uh, ambitious and which I think gets well beyond the three act structure. So he'd always done that. And in the, again, in, in the nineties, in the later nineties, he makes movies like the gingerbread man and to some extent, Cookie's fortune and to some extent, Dr. T and the women and Gosford park. I have to mention, uh, you know, which all, they tell good stories in ways that audiences can relate to. And then the company, in a way, he's going back to more of that large canvas uh, structure where he's dealing, again, with a, a very 
focus kind of a subject, uh, you know, in this case, it's going to be, you know, the world of ballet, uh, but where he's going to deal with, you know, mainly one character, but yes, a whole lot of secondary characters there as well. And he does get away, as he has, I think, often in the past, gotten away from, from three-act structure. Now, his very last movie, A Prairie Home Companion, absolutely uh, a, uh, a swan song. And I, I mentioned before that I, I, I did an onstage interview with Altman and Garrison Keillor. I'm not as all convinced that Garrison and Keeler much like that movie. And it's interesting that they weren't allowed to mention Lake Wobegon, probably Garrison's most famous uh, trope <laughs> uh, in the, ra- the, the radio series, uh, Prairie Home Companion, because uh, Garrison was saving that up for his own uh, work that he was going to do at some point. At least that's why I think it was. Uh, but Altman said at that time that as far as he was concerned, the Prairie Home Companion, and this was not the only thing he said, and maybe not even the thing he sort of stressed, but he said it was a movie that kind of had death all over it. Uh, and it really does. Uh, you know, and I mean, a lot of his movies do. Um, a wedding, the whole wedding takes place with Granny dead upstairs you know, in her bedroom, and nobody wanted to acknowledge it because they don't want to spoil the wedding. Uh, and The Prairie Film Companion, which comes out in 2006, and Altman himself dies the same year, and it is a movie which has really a lot of death in it. It's a movie which I think was written off by a lot of people at the time. It was regarded as just a knockoff of something that Garrison Keillor really created. I think that the movie really has its share of miscalculations. I have very little patience with all of that Kevin Klein stuff. The character called Guy Noir, who sort of sets the whole thing up as a sort of a film where I don't think that works, doesn't work for me at all. But uh, what the movie does have, and this goes back again to one of Altman's very early interests, at least as early as Three Women, it has this dreamlike structure. And there's a moment when the camera is on one floor with a certain number of characters, and then suddenly it sort of rises above, and it goes to the next floor, and there's a bunch of other characters, and I thought, oh, now this is going to be a good Altman movie because geography is dissolving before our eyes. You can go from one place to another the way you do in a dream or the way you do in a vision or maybe the way you do in a movie when the movie is really working out of unconscious as well as conscious sources. And once I realized that was happening, I got into a Prairie Home Companion. And again, I think it has its miscalculated elements, uh, but gee, it has a lot of fascinating, extremely Altman-esque stuff along the way. Uh, It is a swan song. I think he... I don't think he knew it would be his last movie, but I think he knew that he was getting near the end of his life. And I think it's a movie where he really takes that on board and in an unlikely fashion in a movie that takes off of a big popular garrison killer public radio phenomenon. Yeah. And it's a movie about obviously this very, this very folksy uh, interconnected environment that seems to have disappeared now. Um, and I, I think at the same time, it's also Altman saying, uh, you're going to miss the kinds of movies I make as well. Uh, just like you, you miss the society that's being portrayed in this film. Uh, could well be. Yeah. I mean, I think that's very, uh, that's a very good, good hypothesis. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, he, I think in a way he is kind of saying goodbye in Prairie Home Companion. And I, I, don't, I don't think that this is necessarily the, the medium that he would have chosen, you know, a, a, a spinoff of, of a public radio series, you know, even mm. a hugely popular one. I think he would have rather made something that came out of one of his dreams or one of his kind of uh, brainstorming sessions with some of the actors and writers he loved most. But having chosen to make a Prairie Home Companion, I think he made it into very, very, very much of a Robert Altman movie. And, you know, one of the earlier things I mentioned was the fact that performers love to work with him because he always welcomed their creative impulse, uh, input and impulses uh, so much. And when you look at just the cast of A Prairie Home Companion, yes, I'm sure there were all kinds of people who were very interested in feeding off the popularity of Garrison Keillor and all of that. Uh, but, you know, when you get a cast that has the likes of Meryl Streep and Lily Tomlin and John C. Riley and Lindsay Lohan and, and uh, uh, Woody Harrelson, uh, you know Kevin Klein, who I mentioned. Uh, when you know you get all these people coming together, and I think you know one of the big reasons is everybody just likes to work with Altman. The movie may turn out to be successful, it may turn out to be a flop, but it will turn out to be an Altman movie, and it will reflect to some extent the personalities of everybody who's in it. I think that everybody who worked with Altman just valued that so much. 